Good morning. I was going to ask you a question, and then I thought it would probably violate your HIPAA rights, and then I thought, you know, it really doesn't matter anymore these days. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you, is there anybody here that takes a pill every single day for any reason? Okay. Some of you probably need to. <laughs> About 25 years ago, um, I found out I had a problem with my thyroid, and they gave me a pill and said, take this every day and you're going to be fine. And so I took it every day, and sure enough, I was fine. The problem is, once I was fine, I thought, okay, I don't need to take this medication anymore. And so I stopped taking this medication. And about three months later, I wasn't fine anymore. I went back to the doctor and he says, oh, have you been taking your pills? I said, oh, yeah, I take my pills. If he would have asked me if I took them every day on time, I probably would have had to tell him, no, I don't do that every day on time. He says, well, we're going to have to increase the dosage because it's not working. So they increased the dosage and all kinds of crazy stuff started happening then. And it took about five or six years for it to finally level out to where I really did feel good. I really felt, you know, myself. I got energy again. And uh, what, I, what I discovered was how important that little pill was every single day for me to take, you know, religiously. I mean, I had to, to get up in the morning. I still do today and make sure it's the first thing I do before I go out the door because I realized that when you take these pills over time, they release chemicals back into your body and, you know, really kind of create some balance for you. I'm telling you this because that's what the gospel is like in our lives. When you partake of the things of God, when you begin to allow him to work in your life and things really kind of level out, you feel good, you feel like things are going your way finally, it's easy for us just to kind of put that aside and say, okay, I got this now. And you go back out and you start living your life and you find out that things are actually worse than they were before. And you come back to God and he, you know, begins to increase the dosage, if you will, to get you leveled out. And he begins to add some things to your life that really will, over time, produce in you some of the kind of balance that we're looking for, some of the kind of peace that we're looking for. And I want to suggest today that in spite of all that's going on around us, and we're getting spoon-fed negativism all the time, all kinds of, of crazy things happening that we have to, to deal with all the time, and it can take your focus off of your relationship with Christ. And you can easily get entangled, you know, with some things that, that just completely take you off of your medication, if you will, take you away from that relationship that you need to have with Jesus Christ. We've spent a lot of our time over the last couple of years talking about, you know, how important it is to keep the main thing the main thing. And we've, indeni we've identified as Christians that the main thing in our lives that, you know, must keep our focus, no matter what's going on, is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. And I'm sure that many of you who are making any effort at all to do this, can testify that it has the potential to give you a really, really good, godly perspective, no matter what. I mean, if you get up and you take that pill, you get up and you prescribe to the Word of God. In other words, you take it, you consume it, and even if it doesn't seem to have any impact on you at all, you just go out into your day. You may not recognize or, or understand the impact that it had until you get home at night and you realize, you know what, I feel pretty good. I went through some really difficult times today, but I feel really good. And sometimes we don't connect the dots. We don't realize I feel really, really good because I love the Lord my God today with all my heart, with all my soul, and all my mind. And when that happens day after day after day, you really do start to find balance. No matter what you're dealing with, every single time your primary focus is on your love relationship with God, 
You understand you are not easily overcome by the daily pressures and struggles of life. You can testify to that. I've had so many people sit in my office and say, Pastor, you know, the best time in my life is when I was completely surrendered to God. It's like, I believe that. I really do. When he becomes the primary focus, you know, you're not easily overcome by all the struggles of life. You have wisdom and you have discernment beyond your own. And you, you have the ability to give God freedom to direct your life. You give him the, the freedom and the ability to direct your words and your thoughts and your actions any way he chooses. Folks, when you keep the main thing the main thing, you allow God to use you, listen to this, to move mountains in other people's lives. Man, when you can take the focus off of you and put it on somebody else, you can stand up right now and testify, I'm sure, the, the impact that makes on your life. When you can go to bed at night knowing that you were able to help somebody else overcome the obstacles in their life, it just doesn't seem, you know, to have the same effect on you when, when you're dealing with your struggles. Loving God with all of our heart, soul, and mind is more than just a Bible verse that, that we memorize. There's some sort of declaration that we recite together every week. Keeping the main thing the main thing, loving God with all of our heart, soul, and mind is a call to action. It's a call to sacrifice. It's a call to commitment and to loyalty. Let me show you what I mean. Jesus said in John 14, 5, if you love me, he says, you'll keep my commandments. In John 14, 23, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. In, for, in John chapter 21, 17, a third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. In other words, if you love me, watch this, you will keep my commands. If you love me, you'll obey my teaching. If you love me, you'll feed my sheep. Now I want you to understand something. This call to action, this call to sacrifice, to commitment, the call to loyalty, the call to, to, to commitment to no matter what, no matter if you feel like it or not, no matter if it's popular, no matter what it requires of you, no matter, no matter what others may think, no matter what, I will love the Lord my God with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. Can you imagine if you got up tomorrow morning and in spite of all the crazy that you have to drive through to, to get to your job, all the crazy you have to, to work through once you get to your job or to school, if you had the kind of mind that said, it really doesn't matter what I deal with or what I face today, I'm just going to choose to love God with everything I got. One of the greatest struggles that God has shown me that people are having from this pandemic is this massive, this massive identity crisis. And the truth is, this identity crisis has worked its way in to literally every sector of our society and our lives. Folks, we don't recognize our country anymore. We don't recognize our school systems anymore. We don't recognize, you know, what a family is supposed to look like anymore. Listen, restaurants, they're completely clueless. Businesses are scrambling to rebrand themselves because they, they have no idea who they are or who they're trying to reach anymore. Churches are trying to apply worldly principles to spiritual problems. And then they're scratching their heads in wonder, you know, why are we so powerless? Well, listen to what the prophet Hosea suggests might just be the problem. He said in verse 6 of chapter 4, My people, God's people, God's church, my people are being destroyed because they don't know me. Do you hear what he said? My people are being destroyed because they don't know me. 
How many times have you thought if the, if the church of Jesus Christ would just rise up in the power and the authority that has been given to them, what kind of difference could we really make if we just knew who we were? If we just knew what we were capable of. Another translation says it this way, my people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. Then he goes on to say, since your priests refuse to know me, I refuse to recognize you as my priests. Since you have forgotten the laws of your God, he says, I will forget to bless your children. Anybody feel like your children are blessed today? Folks, our old nature and our new nature demand that we make a choice. Our old nature says, listen to me. Our old nature says, listen to your past, to your family and your friends. I mean, look around at what's going on and listen to the world. Listen to the world. They'll tell you what you're, what you're supposed to do. They'll tell you, you know, who you are. Problem for all of us Christians is that our new nature says in Isaiah 43, 1, listen to the Lord who created you. Don't listen to the world. Don't listen to your past. Don't listen to your family and your friends. Listen to the Lord who created you. Because you are who He says you are. When you read that, you realize you have a choice to make. And trust me, there are a lot of things in our lives that will influence that choice. But none, none are greater than the one I want to talk about this morning. I mean, you can look at all your habits and your hang-ups and your hurts. You can look at all your your past mistakes, your childhood. You can look at your family and your friends. And all of that can have the ability to cause you to choose a false identity. An identity that denies who God says you are. An identity that refuses to listen to God. But none of those things have a greater influence over your decision-making than your love relationship with God. None of them do. That's why I believe it's so important for us to focus on keeping the main thing the main thing. When I realize that I must love the Lord my God with all my heart, all my soul, and all my mind, when I realize the power and the importance in my love relationship with God, it makes it so much easier to deny all the competing voices in my life for my true identity. In other words, when I just focus on my love relationship with God, It gives me a perspective, a perspective that empowers me to move forward no matter what opposition stands before me. Have you noticed how many voices are in your head trying to tell you who you are? How many voices in your head who are trying to tell you who you should be or what you should try to become or what you should do with your life? In all my years trying to minister to people, I've never never seen a greater identity crisis in people's lives than I have today. And it doesn't matter how young or old you are. The problem is the world, the devil, and the flesh offer you a new identity every day. You have family and friends and peer groups that demand it of you. So you get another tattoo. I mean, you get another piercing, you get a different wardrobe, you get a different hairstyle, a different address. Listen, you might get a different spouse a different job, a different church, and more often than you could ever imagine, even a different God. The number one cause for this growing dissatisfaction in people's lives is this identity crisis. God wants to end this crisis today. He's given you a new identity that's found in Christ and can only be be received through a love relationship with Him. There are so many people who struggle to to accept their new identity in Christ. I mean, their life seems to always be an uphill climb. You've seen those folks, haven't you? I mean, they give their life to Christ. They they do everything they think is necessary to change, and yet life just seems to always be tripping them up. And then there are those who seem to really enjoy their new identity. I mean, it doesn't matter what's happening in their life. They always seem, you know, to overcome those obstacles. You know, the difference that I've noticed in those two is so obvious, at least to me, almost always, almost always, it is their perception of God's love for them. Almost always. Their perception of God's love for them. 
and their love for him. Getting a revelation of God's love for you, and I'm not talking about the in general for God so loved the world, you know, sort of, of revelation, but the revelation that God loves you specifically and personally, and that I must love him with all my heart, soul, and mind. Folks, this is so important. It's so important, especially if we truly want to believe that we are who he says we are. Because context really does matter. Especially when you're reading his word, when you're listening for his voice, worshiping him or living out your calling. Listen, if you do not have a clear revelation of God's love, you know, for you and your love for him, if you mistrust his intentions towards you, or you think he's going to be a hard master when you fail, or you suspect that he's always going to tell you to eat your vegetables and never offer you dessert, at least spiritually speaking, if you mistrust his intentions towards you, then you're probably going to misunderstand a lot of things, including your new identity. I mean, every time you open up the book, you're going to read it and you're going to see and sense and feel the judgment of God rather than the love of God. Loving God and loving others is going to be a real struggle for you. I mean, every setback you have will feel like correction or discipline. You'll interpret every uncertain word from Him in the most negative way. Your faith in your new identity will become you know, something that's impossible to live up to. You're going to see a standard in a bar, and you're going to think, I'm never going to get there. You know, it's like the fifth grader standing in the gym looking at a 10-foot, you know, basketball goal, thinking, I'm never going to dunk the ball. In Jeremiah 29, 13, God says, if you look for me wholeheartedly, he said, you'll find me. Now, I want you to think about this, and I want you to think about that passage and the cause and effect of seeking God like the prophet Jeremiah was talking about here. Because the first thing I want you to notice is the cause. John 6, says that no one can come to the Father unless no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me and at the last day I will raise them up. So first of all, the only reason you're seeking God, if you're here this morning and you're seeking God, it's not because you woke up and thought, you know, I think I'll try something new today and I'll just go to church. No one seeks God. Not one, but it's God who draws all men to himself. I've had Christians tell me that they've never seen God ever work in their lives. But if you're a Christian, that's just not true. The only way you got saved is God was doing a work in your life that drew you to himself. The cause of God drawing you is for you to come to know him, to know his love for you, and for you to receive a new life, a new identity, and a new direction. That's the cause of seeking God. And the effect that seeking, finding, and knowing God should have on us, I think is very clear and very simple, is loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That ought to be the effect that, that God pursuing us has on us. Because it's not possible, folks, to find God without finding his love and his passion for you. And when you truly experience that type of encounter with him, you can't help but respond like Paul did in Philippians 3.8, where he tells us everything else is worthless. Everything I knew and did and trusted before is worthless compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Paul says, for his sake, I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. Paul's saying, I love God with all that I have all that I am, and all that I ever will be. Folks, does that describe your love for God? If not, then you understand this is the number one reason. You're struggling with your new life and your new identity in Christ. Listen, I've ridden this wave of inconsistent love more times than I care to admit. I mean, when I'm struggling with my identity in Christ, it affects every single area of my life. And I suddenly find myself constantly reprioritizing things. Let me give you an example. When I'm struggling with my identity in Christ, I start, 
you know, listening to the world and the flesh and the devil. And as I said, all of that, you know, along with, with you know, who everybody else says I ought to be, begins to challenge my, my priorities. And sometimes by the very minute, and suddenly my wife and my family, they drop down on my priority list. Because this morning I have to be this guy, and this afternoon, you know, they're going to drop down a little bit further on my list because now I have to be this guy, and by tonight I forgot not to even have a family. Because, you see, I have to be somebody altogether different for all of these different people. And here's the thing, it's even worse with God. It's even worse with God because I don't always see God. I mean, it's impossible for me to ignore the disappointment in the faces of my family, especially when you tell them, that's my job. Sorry, that's just who I am. That's, what I, you know, that's, what I, that's what's expected of me. Or the worst excuse I ever had is, sorry, you know, I don't have a choice. Man, we always got a choice. That's a lie straight out of hell, isn't it? I don't have a choice. Listen, I love my family, but when I'm trying to be anything other than who God says I am, my, my love relationship with them is non-existent. I mean, there will be no evidence of my love whatsoever. And even my vain attempts will be so guilt-ridden that it will be exposed for the phony facade that it is. And here's the thing. Once you've conditioned yourself and other people to this kind of love relationship long enough, it really does become a way of life. And you're, re- you're going to respond to each other and it's always going to be out of guilt or some sort of manipulation. You're always making excuses. You never find those deep connections anymore. Many of you are living like that right now with one another. In fact, you don't even remember the last time you know that, that you were on the top of somebody's priority list. Let alone know what it's like to have someone do something for you purely as a result of their love. Most of you know what I'm talking about. You have or you are right now experiencing this kind of love relationship with somebody. And remember, I told you the number one reason for this kind of behavior is because of our identity crisis. Now that's us with each other. Can you imagine having this kind of relationship with God? I mean, everything you do for Him is out of guilt. Every time you give to him, it's nothing more than a generous act of manipulation. Your service to him is equal to maybe paying your power bill or just settling a debt. Whenever you happen to spend time with him, it's out of obligation, not out of desire. In other words, your response to God is like your response to all your other relationships. And like all of those other love relationships, whoever you choose to believe you are, will determine how you're going to respond in all of those relationships. Remember I told you what's in the well comes up in the bucket. Whatever you believe will determine what you do. Now this doesn't mean that there's no love in those relationships. It doesn't mean there's no hope. In fact, quite the contrary. If you would commit to loving the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and you choose to accept your new identity that's been given to you, and if you choose to believe you are who He says you are, not only would your relationship with God be restored and renewed, so would all your other relationships. Let me tell you how I know that. Because Jesus says so. Jesus said that loving God with all of our heart, heart, soul, and mind is the greatest commandment you know, that's been given to us, and the, si- the second is like unto it. He says, love your neighbor as you love you. Folks, it's not possible to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind and not love one another. Jesus demonstrated that on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them. Why? Because they know not what they do. Jesus said in John 13, 35, that your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. When you're able to accept your new identity in Christ, when you choose to listen to the Lord who created you, who said that you are his child, 
When you choose to believe that you are who he says you are, you're going to have a lot of mad love for yourself. And you think, well, pastor, that seems kind of selfish. He said, you can't love your neighbor unless you love yourself. You know how you love yourself? Same way Jesus did, by forgiving yourself. You know, Jesus loved you by showing you how much he forgave you. And you need to forgive yourself. You need to love yourself so you can love your neighbor. I've had so many people tell me over the years, Pastor, I want to change. I don't like living like this. I don't want to be like this anymore. I really want to love God with all my heart, soul, and mind. I really want to love myself so that I can love my neighbor. What do I need to change in my life to make that happen? Well, the first thing you got to understand is that a simple change in your life is not what you need. Let me explain. If you look up the word change in a dictionary, change is described as a substitute or to replace something. Listen, that's not going to get you to the kind of love relationship with God and others. However, transformation will. Transformation is defined as a complete change, not a substitute or something in your life or replacing something in your life, but rather a complete change. A complete change usually unto something with an improved appearance or usefulness. There's definitely a lot of similarities in change and transformation. And the results may at times even look exactly alike to a lost and dying world. That's why as Christians, God has given us new life, not changed life. Not an improved life, not even a better than before life. Listen, if you're living in poverty under an overpass somewhere, you know, and, and your life is just a mess, I can come and I can move you to a better neighborhood and I can put you in better conditions. I can get you a bath and a haircut. And you will absolutely, you know, probably tell everybody that you have a better than before life. But you understand better than before life? It doesn't equal new life. When you were born, you have embedded in your DNA the ability to transform into an adult. And as born-again children of God, we too have embedded into our spiritual DNA the ability to transform into the likeness of Christ into the new, the, the new life that we have been called. We have the ability to take on a new and transformed identity. Let me tell you, there's a world of difference between improvement and transformation. Improvement can absolutely make you a better person. I've seen this in the lives of many addicts, you know, have gotten themselves clean. The problem is, by their own testimony, they're still addicts. They're still enslaved by their past. And listen, I've witnessed this so many times while attending AA meetings or NA meetings with somebody where those who were, were recovering would introduce themselves as alcoholics or drug addicts. Folks, in improvement, improvement can absolutely make you a better person. But understand, it lacks the power and the ability to make you a new one. In our life before Christ... We allow the choices that we've made to define us. And that, along with all of our mistakes, all of those hurts and hang-ups, create within us some pretty deep regrets. And those regrets have caused many of us to live with an inability to fully separate ourselves from our past. However, when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that we are a new creation. He tells us that the old has gone and the new has come. Immediately, immediately, we have new life in Christ. We have a new identity. Now, there may be some parts of your transformation that will be more of a process, kind of like taking that pill that I told you about. I didn't get better on the first day that I took that pill, but over several weeks and sometimes several months, you know, my body started to balance out. And spiritually, the same thing happens during transformation. There's going to be those things that just doesn't happen overnight. It's going to be a process. 
But this part of your transformation, new life, that's immediate. You immediately have new life and a new identity. It's kind of like going into the witness, the witness protection program, folks. As long as you are God's witness, He's going to protect you. As long as you choose to live by your new identity, you're going to be safe. But if you try to dabble with your old identity in any way, you run the risk of being rediscovered by your past and ultimately destroyed by it. And trust me, your friends, your friends and your enemies are definitely going to challenge the authenticity of your new life and they're going to remind you relentlessly of your old one. That's what it was like when I got saved. People couldn't believe that there was something, you know, genuinely happening in my life. You know, when I no longer talk like I used to talk, I didn't frequent the places I used to frequent. I mean, people couldn't believe it. They mocked me. Listen, they're going to insist that although you may have changed your clothes, maybe your address, even put on a new suit, you're still the same guy in that new suit. But God promises. He promises us to remember our past no more especially all those failures and mistakes that we've made. And here's the thing, he doesn't stop with just forgetting our sin. He separates us from them. Psalm 103, 12 says he separates us from them as far as the east is from the west. And then he says, that's all gone now. And you can start your new life from here. Man, how many of you want to leave today starting your new life from here right now. Even as Christians, wouldn't you just love to push the reset button this morning? Walk out here and it's like, okay, listen, I just pushed the reset button. It's all brand new. I don't care what I did yesterday. I don't care what I said in the parking lot. Right now, right this minute, I push the reset button. God has taken my sin. He's thrown it as far as the east is from the west. He remembers it no more. And from this point forward, no matter what happens, I'm going to love Jesus with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. Let me tell you, when we live from that newness of life and from our new identity, not only does the way we see ourselves change, eventually, even the way we look to those around us will change as well. That doesn't mean that all those opposing voices in our heads are going to go away. There's always going to be those subtle reminders those subtle reminders of who and what we used to be and what we used to do. But folks, you got to remember, it's speaking of another life and another time. It's referring to the past of a dead man. Those who have experienced the new, the new man in you, they're going to want to embrace that new life and that new identity with you. And your life really will begin to transform. Your past really will begin to, to fade into distant memories. And all those regrets, they're only going to serve as a reminder to you of the amazing grace that's been poured out on your life. The Bible warns us over and over to be on our guard because we have an enemy that would love nothing more than to discourage us, that would love nothing more than to cause us to doubt God's love for us, that would love nothing more than to distract us with lies about our identity. He shoots those fiery darts of lies into our minds all day long in hopes of causing us to question if what God has said to us and about us is really true. As born-again believers in Jesus Christ that have been given new and abundant life, a new and amazing identity, we can never, folks, we can never settle for improvement especially when we have been given the power and the authority to have real change, to have a new heart. We can never be willing to settle for a better than before life or even a slightly improved life or anything short of a brand new transformed life in Christ. And the only way to ensure that, the only way to ensure that you never settle is to keep the main thing the main thing. To love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Think about the transformation of a caterpillar. Because, folks, that's the kind of transformation God intends for your life. 
the kind of transformation that changes more than just our minds, more than just our direction, the kind of change that transforms literally our nature. You probably haven't seen this happen in a lot of Christians, you know, especially those who are simply clothing their new nature in old ways, which usually happens because they have no idea the power that's available to them. This is one of the main reasons I believe so many of God's children are settling for a few minor improvements or at least a better than before life instead of a lasting real transformation. As I said earlier, when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, the capacity for transformation, think about this, it's embedded in us. It's already there. No matter what it takes, no matter how intense the battle is at times, we've got to be committed to break free from our old life. You understand the life that God has called us to is already within us. But to experience the fullness of this life, we've got to leave the old life and the old nature behind. And we've got to live in the new transformed nature that we've been given through Christ. Over 30 years of ministry has exposed the real-life challenges in this to me. I mean, folks, I know it's hard to walk away from what we know. It's hard to walk away from the familiar. It's hard to walk away from the comfortable, the predictable, and then walk into the unknown, walk into the unfamiliar, the uncomfortable, and the unpredictable. That's a tough thing to do, especially with all the other crazy chaos that's going on. But in order for us to, to, to experience real transformation, God expects you to do your part. And your part is simple. You need to choose daily. Think about how easy this is. Choose daily just to love Him. I'm just going to love God, man. And we already got the definition. Remember what He said? If you love me, you'll obey me. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. If you love me, you'll feed my sheep. That's not hard, right? In other words, get your eyes off of you and get your eyes on Him. If you love me, if you feed my sheep, if you keep my commands, you've got to avoid situations where you're tempted to resuscitate your old nature. You've got to be willing to move into your new life and your new identity. Paul says in Romans 13, 14, in, in the Phillips translation, he says, don't give any chances for the flesh to have its fling. There's going to be times when your old nature will invite you to a reunion of your old ways. You guys probably have already experienced that dozens of times. Your old nature is going to invite you to indulge in a few of your old past habits or compulsions to enjoy the pleasures of sin for old time's sake, to surrender yourself to a momentary fling. Listen, don't allow yourself to be put into tempting situations like that. If you have a problem with drinking, don't stock a bar at home. If you have a, a, a real problem with lust, get rid of those magazines. Get rid of those, 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 computer, the, those computer channels that you shouldn't be watching. If you have a problem overeating, stay out of the junk food aisle. You know what I'm talking about. Stay away from the things that cause you problems. Stay away from the, the things that remind you of who you were. Surround yourself with things and people who will remind you of who you are in Christ. People and things that will, will, will lead you into new life. And acknowledge. Man, tell people, no, this really is who I am. Acknowledge your new identity. I told you. Satan wants to challenge the authenticity of your new life and your new identity. You understand, he wants to delegitimize everything about your faith in Christ. You ain't no Christian. Man, the way you talk, the way you act, you sound just like everybody else in the, in the neighborhood. You act just like everybody else on, on the news. Where's the difference? I mean, Satan would love to delegitimize everything about your faith. That's why the Bible tells us in Proverbs 24, plan carefully what you do. Avoid evil. Paul said in Ephesians 4.27, don't give the devil a foothold in your life. 
Folks, we tend to embrace negativism so easily and, and much more readily than we do optimism. So don't put yourself in those situations where you're constantly being reminded of your old redeemed life. Instead, choose to believe that you are who God says you are. I understand this may mean you have to choose some new friends. Go ahead, get you some good redeemed friends. You know, they may be a little quirky in the beginning, but eventually you'll be just as quirky as they are. You need friends who want to walk in the new life with you, friends that, that like your new identity. You may need to, to change your job or move, move to a new neighborhood. The Bible says flee. Think about this. Flee temptation. Run from it. Avoid it at all cost. Folks, the problem for most of us is when we flee temptation, we keep leaving a forwarding address. We need to learn to burn some bridges. We need to transform into the person God's empowered us to be. As I close, let me say again, no matter what the cost, your new life and your new identity in Christ requires you to do whatever it takes to move forward into the future God's called you to. So whatever sacrifice you make, you can believe for all that you are that it will be worth the abundant life that Jesus has promised you. Seems as though everyone, no matter what their life is like, everyone is constantly in search of improvement, but give little thought to transformation. God says we can have transformation, folks. Question is, do you really want that? Because that kind of change is a process. That kind of change requires you to go where you've never been before. That kind of change forfeits the familiar. That kind of change leaves us vulnerable and exposed. And that kind of change only comes to those who are willing to be uncomfortable. You really can become new. You really can have a new identity. You really can love God with all your heart, soul, and mind but you will absolutely be stretched in the process. You can count on that. Don't be intimidated by it, but count on it. Don't allow yourself. Don't allow yourself to settle for improvement, especially when God's offering you real transformational change. A brand new heart, a brand new nature, a brand new life, and a brand new identity. We've been empowered to overcome sin, not to settle for it, not to live in it. Sin is no longer who you are as a believer. It may be what you do, but it's not who you are. We can never be willing to settle for better than before life or even improve life or anything short of a brand new transformed life in Christ. And the only way to ensure that you never, never, never settle is to, to learn to keep the main thing the main thing. And that is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Would you stand with me this morning as we close? going to have our counselors come and as they do your heads bowed and your eyes closed there may be some people here right now who have never exchanged that old life for a new one and those of you that have those of you that understand what it means to transform would you pray right now for those that have never experienced that and if you're that person that's never experienced that God wants to this morning right now give you an opportunity to to exchange the old life for a new one and it may be that simple of a prayer for you come down this morning and pray with one of these counselors and just say you know what today is the day that I push the reset button today is the day that I exchange my old life for a new one and let God begin to have his way with you if you're here and you're part of the, the, the family of God already you've been born again Jesus saved your soul but you know for all that you're worth that your focus has been anywhere 
except on a love relationship with him. As God gives you this opportunity during this time of invitation, would you come?